going to give an overview of the cargo performance of the year and the outlook for cargo moving forward. Um, then our global head of cargo, Brett Sullivan, is going to talk about the priorities in the industry, challenges it's facing. And then finally, we'll move to Henk um, Mulder, who's our head of digital cargo, and he's going to talk about digitalization of the industry. So, Rachel. Green line rise above 
the blue line and the red line. And 2022 saw a downturn for air cargo when the green line deviates from the blue line and the red line. And then in 2023, we saw air cargo recover and trying to converge, the green line is trying to converge with the red line and closing the gap. So what happened during these years? Well, in 2020 and 2021, when nations went into lockdowns and when their passenger flights were grounded, that's when air cargo entered the center stage and played a vital role in maintaining global supply chain. The air passenger flights that comes along with the passenger valley capacity used to carry more than half of cargo capacities, which you can see represented by the red area. And with a sudden pause of air passenger traffic, we saw a severe shortage of cargo space. But in the meantime, the demand for time sensitive and fast deliveries is still there. So that's what air cargo, with airlines creatively innovated these printers by converting air passenger crafts into cargo carriers. <coughs> and these printers played a critical role in delivering essential items, for example, the personal protection equipment, the medications, and eventually vaccines around the world. And this is what Air Cargo came in to rescue and became the hero during these hardest times. In the meantime, another important driver of the Air Cargo demand comes from the change in consumer habits and the surge of e-commerce. So when people around the world rely more on online shopping and fast delivery, Air Cargo became instrumental in adjusting and supporting to this new economic dynamic. So that's what happens in 2021, when many industries face downturns and even shut down, and cargo actually shows remarkable resilience and even growth. Well, in 2022, we saw stability of uh, global supply chain and uh, less urgency of fast delivery, and that's when the demand of air cargo starts to diminish. In the meantime, we also see, as you can see here, the increase in the red area. We also see a strong coming back of air passenger traffic, which brings back the passenger value capacity and loosen the tightness of cargo demand supply gap that we experience. So let's zoom in and see what happens for each region. What have they been through and what's the recovery? Um, among the total global air cargo market, uh, airlines registered in Asia Pacific takes the biggest uh, market share uh, for the past several years. And they're represented by the red edge line here. You can see from this line that uh, there has been ups and downs during the past three years, affected, also affected by macroeconomic headwinds. And it's now converged to pre-pandemic levels and stays within 1% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, during the past three months, so I'd say it's pretty um, stabilized. And the second largest market is in North America. That's represented by the blue line here. And you can see a strong growth in that region that's most attributed to the surging e-commerce. And I have to admit that I personally contributed to that. <laughs> Definitely more than average per capita. Um, according to the data from U.S. Census Bureau, the size of U.S. e-commerce surged by 43% in one year in 2020. The size increased from 570 billion U.S. dollars in 2019 and increased to more than 800 billion U.S. dollars in 2020. So that surge helped boost the demand of air cargo in this region. Uh, following that, we have the gold line representing Europe and uh, green dot demand representing the Middle East. They all show similar patterns as we saw for Asia Pacific, but except for the macroeconomic impact, they are also affected by geopolitical tensions in this region. First the war in the Ukraine, and then uh, more recently uh, conflicts in the Middle East. Um, and then we have the purple line representing Latin America. They saw a in uh, during 2021, but they have now almost fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Last but not least, the green line represents Africa. Uh, they started from a low base, and they also benefited from being less affected by COVID. Uh, they, uh, they show a strong and continuous growth during the past uh, three years. 
Looking forward, we have already introduced how trade has been e the essential, the most <coughs> important driving force for air cargo traffic. And uh, <coughs> global trade looks set to improve. The IMF is expecting a growth of uh, global trade at 0.9% uh, in 2023. This is not just uh, the path of uh, global demand, but in the meantime, it's also affected by, um, for example, um, the strengthening of US dollar, which is uh, the currency that most of the airline, uh, uh, most of the air, their cargo goods are invoiced in. So when the, when the USD appreciates, the air cargo goods becomes more expensive for the world to purchase. So that's one force. And of course, uh, more, more barriers also comes into play that's behind this 0.9% growth. And for 2024, the world trade is expected to increase by 3.5%. What does that mean for the air cargo? With all of these variables coming to play, the GDP, the trade growth, um, the inflation, unemployment, so we use all of these variables and now we expect the industry to decrease by 3.8% this year with Latin America being the only region that's gonna have a positive annual growth um, in 2023. And then for the next year, 2024, we're expecting all regions to register positive growth uh, with the uh, net by Middle East with a 12.3% growth and um, Europe with a 4.1% growth, and we expect the industry to grow at 4.5% of average. So, so far we've been discussing about air cargo traffic volume, which means we've been talking about quantity, but there's another item in the revenue equation, which is the price. So let's take a look at the yield. The yield price has been on historically high levels in 2021, and we just saw that this is where the demand and supply play together. There's a surge of demand, but not enough supply to come along. And during the past two years, we saw yield price coming down from its peak, and there are two forces coming into play. One is the coming back of passenger traffic that brings the passenger valley capacity, of course. And the other one comes from the stabilization of global sustainability, and the previous backlog that happened in the maritime shipping methods are starting to be solved. So we're facing competition from maritime cargo rates as well. Both these forces are putting downward pressures on EU prices. And more recently, we saw a surge in jet fuel price. That's what you see in the blue dash line. So that's why we see a slight tick of EU price at the end of uh, September. So looking forward, we're expecting the cargo traffic to decrease slightly this year before ticking up next year. And we're expecting the cargo yield price to come off from its uh, unsustained high levels in 2021 and 2022 and uh, to continue to decline in 2023 and 2024. And nonetheless, we still expect the yield price to remain above pre-pandemic levels. You probably have already seen this chart before, just a recap, that uh, with all the challenges, the wars, the volatility of oil price, the elevated interest rates, um, and the staff shortage, all of these weigh on the financial performance of global airlines. And despite that, we expect the global airlines to return to profitability this year for the first time since the pandemic. Uh, we, we expect a net margin of 2.6% this year and 2.7% next year. This shows a remarkable piece and we, that achieved in an equally remarkable short period of time. Zooming in for cargo, uh, for, for 2023, because of the drop in the quantity and in the volume and also the drop in the yield price, we expect uh, the cargo revenue to to decline by 37% year on year. And uh, for next year, um, although we expect the yield price to remain above pre-pandemic levels, but the sharp decline in the yield price will offset the expected increase in cargo volume 
and resulted in a decrease in cargo revenue. However, compared to pre-pandemic levels, we still expect cargo revenue to be 34% of 2019 levels and 11 per this year and 11% above 2019 levels next year. And in terms of the profit split between passenger and cargo, we expect this ratio to converge to pre-pandemic levels so that the cargo revenue would uh, converge to around 12% of the total airline revenues. To sum up, 2021 was the year that we saw demand met with unprecedented innovation when freighters came into rescue. And 2022, we saw the year of stabilization with challenges transitioning from crisis to a new normal. And in 2023, we saw consistent recovery and we observed steady month on month improvements. 2024, we anticipate sustained revenue growth outperforming pre pandemic levels. I hope you enjoyed this speech. <laughs> and uh, coming along, our global head of cargo, Brent Sullivan, will give you more interesting aspects. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Brendan Sullivan. And today I'm going to talk to you uh, about the industry priorities, uh, where they're, um, you know, the, the specific aspects of that related to, to air cargo, and then get into some of the, the things that we've delivered over the course of the year and why that's important for the, uh, the globe as a whole. So, what are these industry priorities? What are, what are they? What is specific about them for air cargo? The first is around digitalization, and really here it's the move from legacy messaging uh, and, and the legacy messaging standard, which was focused around digitizing a, a paper document, uh, to a data sharing approach using modern uh, web APIs. Uh, it's much more efficient. It's much more effective. Uh, and my colleague Hank is actually going to go into detail on that. Uh, in terms of sustainability, obviously we're supporting the industry's net zero commitments. Additionally, we want to increase efficiency and reduce uh, waste inside the air cargo operations. So I'll touch on what, what we're doing in those specific areas are on, on the ground. And lastly, when it comes to safety and security, securing and facilitating cross-border movements, so that's both the safety aspects for things like dangerous goods and lithium batteries, uh, as well as the customs and facilitation movements that we have around the globe and how they're kind of m mixing uh, as we move forward. Well, I think Rachel covered this extremely well, um, but just, and, and maybe it's not that the challenges are mounting, but that the challenges are actually continuing. So for example, the war in the Ukraine has grounded some of the key players. It's disrupted supply chains. It's not the only geopolitical issue that we've seen but it is certainly one of them that's affected us in, in this year. Um, there is continued economic volatility, which has brought on inflation, uh, weaker trading environment, um, shifting currency rates, uh, and slower GDP growth overall, which is affecting consumers more generally. Uh, and lastly, if we look at another region of the world, there are still concerns on how supply, China's supply chain is developing when supply chain and manufacturing companies talk about de-risking their supply chain and how they may be moving around. These developments are still ongoing, so it's an area of challenge that we continue to monitor. On the plus side, on the positive side, the e-commerce absolutely continues to grow and it continues to be a significant driver uh, for air cargo. Um, with that comes these shorter delivery times. The e-commerce demand is, is speed and air cargo can absolutely deliver that. And it requires cooperation from governments to improve those delivery times reduce any dwell that might exist inside the supply chain. There has been a very strong rebound and incredible resilience in this industry on passenger traffic, which brought with it more belly capacity, which is available for, for cargo. So those are, that's still a positive development. And lastly, the high value specialized cargo. cargo. So looking at pharmaceutical products, um, as an example, are proving resistant to some of these economic ups and downs that we've been seeing. So on digitalization, as I mentioned, Hank Mulder is gonna go into detail on this one. Uh, and what I wanted to focus on here is just 
to, to call out and use an example of, of Classy. Classy is preloading advanced cargo information, um, and it is a specific data set that is shared uh, along the supply chain with the customs authorities um, to perform an additional layer of security. So it's where customs is actually performing security risk assessments prior to loading. Now, uh, what we have is a number of these different Classy regimes being implemented throughout the world. Uh, the latest was in Europe with the movement towards EU's ICS2 system, uh, what we are seeing uh, in the UAE, in Canada, and there are existing programs as well. Um, what we need to do and what we need to make sure happens is that these programs, one, achieve their objective of this uh, additional layer of security, but do not impact cargo flows. They don't slow down and they don't create friction at borders and at transit points. And for that to occur, governments absolutely must work closely together to deploy a Classy program. We have a number of examples where freight may move across multiple Classy regimes. And if those programs are not aligned, all of a sudden the data sets can't be shared and they cannot be used for the purpose that it was intended. And trade flows actually stop or slow uh, and we have increased dwell time, all of which negatively affect the types of commodities that we move uh, in air cargo. <clears throat> On sustainability, we've heard, you've heard already this morning uh, about all of the different initiatives that we have on sustainability, so I'm not going to repeat that. What I want to talk about is some of the additional areas where air cargo contributes to achieving some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Oh, absolutely committed to achieving the air cargo industry's net zero commitments, uh, but in addition to that, uh, looking at the utilization of single-use plastics. Uh, that's not terribly different from the rest of aviation, which is also focusing on that. However, uh, the plastics themselves are different. We have different uses for them, uh, and they're spread out throughout the supply chain. So there's some complexity in making sure that we find alternatives and that we reduce that use. The other is on the reduction of perishable loss in the supply chain, and that's the supply chain end to end from point of production uh, onwards through to, to consumer, but certainly with air transport playing its role to reduce any loss that you might have there. Um, to advocate for sustainable and efficient air cargo facilities, I think in the past there was a perception that air cargo facilities uh, may not have been the most efficient uh, buildings in the world, and what we need to make sure is that we're, we're moving in that direction, uh, that we're using uh, modern approaches inside the facility as well as for its functioning. And lastly, around people, so attracting, developing, and retaining young talent within the air cargo industry. Uh, we have a program called the Future Air Cargo Executive Program to help um, kind of deliver on that. <clears throat> Touching on um, some of the, the, the perishable products that we were talking about, and just special cargo more generally. So special cargo typically can represent up to 58% of the overall cargo revenue, uh, depending on the, the, the business model <coughs> of those airlines. Um, and you can see that of the perishable products, 12% of them are uh, fruits and vegetables, many of which are food. So focusing on and making sure that we minimize any loss that we might have throughout the supply chain is incredibly important so that they connect producers to actual markets and consumers so that the food and the perishable products actually end up in the mouths of the people who are uh, looking to purchase them. A couple of other interesting figures, so when we talk about transporting dangerous goods, which represents nearly a third of all special cargo, 27% uh, of that is actually lithium batteries. And it's increasing year on year as we purchase significantly more devices, either through e-commerce or, or other means. Um, and, and just to highlight some of the great work that was done throughout the air cargo industry, over 13 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine were administered, many of which were flying by air, because that was the only way to connect these countries uh, and the places that needed them. So what we've done just recently is we've released uh, one, the first one is a new guidance on perishable loss reduction in air cargo, um, showing how much of a priority uh, the, the, the timely delivery of perishable goods is to, to air cargo. Uh, it identifies three areas of, of that are where we have common uh, commonality for loss, so that could be damage, that could be delays, uh, and that could also be transit processes that could either be uh, customs processes or regulatory processes, but it could also be operational ones. And then it offers a number of strategies for the industry uh, to, to actually reduce and mitigate any of that loss. 
And the second area is really around this future talent. So this was this is a paper that was actually written by our future cargo executive community. Uh, so these are young people under the age of 35 um, who are committed to uh, attracting people to the industry. And they identified five different areas for the industry to focus on. I put them in this paper. So these are the things that they think are incredibly important to focus on. And you can see that these are all the things that, that align to businesses, but that may not be in place consistently across the board. Um, I mean, the pandemic has really shown us, and it's thrust into the, into the forefront, that cargo changes and, and saves lives. Um, the UN World Food Program estimates that 362 million people will be in need of humanitarian uh, assistance and protection in 2023. So that is a record high, unfortunately, a record high, and basically means one in 22 people will be required some form of assistance across the globe. So it shows just how important it is that we deliver as a community, as a global community, and Air Cargo absolutely responds to that. If we take the example of the earthquake response in Turkey and in Syria uh, earlier in the year, um, there was an incredible amount of aid delivered, so 3,500 tons from 90 different countries all over the world to, to support that emergency. And then the other innovative thing that the air cargo industry did was set up these air bridges. So the uh, EU humanitarian air bridge, for example, has delivered more than 4,000 tons of aid, over 165 different operation types to deliver for, for relief operations. The last thing I want to touch on is safety and security. Uh, first component, lithium batteries. Uh, lithium batteries are found in just about every one of our electronic devices. And obviously we want to take the data that's available around incidents, around issues, and have a continued risk management approach so that we can mitigate any risks. Uh, in addition to that, there have been some improvements around the transportation conditions for them to uh, offer even more uh, barrier and even more margin uh, when we're transporting them. So one is a reduced state of charge, and the second is a new designation for vehicles so that we can identify vehicles when they're moving in transportation. Before, uh, in particular, small vehicles would have just been considered battery-powered equipment, but they really do have different considerations. So that's going to be coming into place in the next couple of years. There'll be some transitional periods for aspects of that for industry to catch up. We're really offering a significant improvement. The other is in ensuring that we have safety of the entire supply chain. So there are many different actors in the supply chain, uh, and we need to make sure that the states who regulate them regulate and oversee the entire supply chain and not just one party or not unnecessarily one party. Um, so there will be some changes to the ICAO Annex 18. They're finalizing what they're actually going to look like, but they provide a regulatory framework for, for regulators around the world to have oversight of the entire supply chain. And lastly, fire-resistant containers, so these are ULDs uh, and other containers that we move around cargo in. We also move bags in them. Uh, and up until now, any fire-resistant container had a, a standard that it was meeting, which, which was for a normal type of fire, a fire that could occur anywhere. Um, and we've now got one that is dedicated specific to, the, to address lithium battery fires, which will be going through the approval process. So we've made a number of significant improvements towards uh, safety over the course of the year. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Kink. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about digitalization, and we'll just see a lot of parallels in what you heard earlier today about cargo and other things. But let's just dive into that. I want to look at some cargo trends first. What you see is that it's come up all, all, all afternoon here about e-commerce growth. And e-commerce, of course, in itself is a digital product. It's a digital experience, but the minute you hit that button on Amazon, somebody gets out of a chair and starts picking up parcels and have to move them around the world with a lot of different stages in between. The increase in e-commerce is a massive challenge for companies, both on the e-commerce side, but also on the, uh, on the recipient side. For example, customs, may be receiving twice as many parcels tomorrow than they did a year ago. That's a big problem. Digitization really helps them in predicting these flows and handling the information that they have to handle. Another big trend, of course, is sustainability. It's been mentioned a few times. But if you think about it, air cargo is not just uh, taking parcels in an airplane or cargo and then delivering it at an airport. 
It's the whole supply chain. It's from the manufacturer to the concernee on the other side of the world. There's a lot of parties in between, as we'll see a little bit later. And the ability to understand their environmental impact together and individually really helps us to optimize the environmental impact and reduce it. Another one that's a big one currently is capacity fluctuations. We've seen the charts earlier about what happened during the pandemic. But even post-pandemic, we've seen the geopolitical issues and frankly having to find new routes around the world. The ability to understand what those routes are, how to adapt quickly to them, requires very clear information about where the problems are, where the, where the, uh, where the capacity is needed, and how you respond to that. So again, digitalization is a big tool in the uh, toolkit for airlines to deal with that. And lastly, and a little bit surprisingly, perhaps technology itself is having a big impact on cargo. Um, a lot of technology that uh, was in the focus for airlines not that many years ago, but then I realized that it's not just digitalization of robotics and other things that help them uh, run a better business. So again, digitalization really helps them to make the best job of that. Let's look a little bit um, at, at what we're really talking about. We often talk about data, and it's easy to think of data as some commodity that you can buy by the kilo, but that really isn't what that is. The information we're dealing with in the air cargo supply chain is very varied, lots of different stakeholders, lots of different functions that are being covered. And here are just a few of them, I'll not slide and we'll go through that without spending too much time on this, but if you look at the number of stakeholders involved in the movement of cargo, if you start at the manufacturer, and already you're starting late, because even before the manufacturer, there's stuff that has to be moved, but the manufacturer has, has products that are being sold, they have to go to a warehouse, before it will pick it up into some sort of hub, before it goes to an airport, before ground handlers start dealing with it, before you get to customs, and it's just one side of the journey. The sort of things we're dealing with here is so varied, whether it has to do with shipment information, like the actual stuff that's being moved, the volume, the weight, the quantity, but also the booking details, you know, who's going to transport this stuff for what price. Cargo handling details, when you're moving a, a, a parcel or a box of diamonds or a racehorse or a race car has a very different impact on what you do with that freight. And that information all has to be communicated up front. We have customs. Customs have plays a big role here. They have lots of questions about the stuff that's going into the country, both for security reasons but also for tax reasons. Then we have the monitoring of the freight itself. When you're moving vaccines, you really want to make sure that the temperatures are controlled all the way, not at the beginning, but just at the end. And that's just half of it. So the other half, you know, it's almost like the journey in reverse. Now you have actual airline gets involved in here as part of the overall process. And if you follow it through, you'll get to the final destination. Again, a lot more information. I won't go through this whole list here. You can see it. But the point is that this information is all connected. You, you, you can't ship something without having the information about the very origin to the very destination and every part in between, and somehow that relates to each other. So the historical solution was to create lots of paperwork, lots of forms, you put them in, in big stacks and you put them into the airplane or lorries or wherever you go. And I don't think it will come as a surprise that that is not something that we can do anymore for lots of reasons. And so the challenge of somehow making this information available at every step of the way for every stakeholder is something that's been a very big focus for the airlines in the last 50 years, to be honest. And so one program that we've been working on at the ANTA is the so-called One Record Program, which is different from the One Order Program. If you're dyslexic, that is an issue, but this is One Record. One Record, the idea is the ability that all of these pieces of information we we're talking about just now are somehow linked digitally so that anybody can access any piece of information throughout the entire journey, throughout the entire supply chain. Obviously, there are concerns about security and data access, all of that is, of course, is included. But the idea you have some sort of data network, a bit like the image that shows here, where you can just surf around the network and get the data you want, just like you surf the web today, is something that is truly innovative and is going to change the air cargo business significantly. Now, we have some targets here. We actually want to have this completed by year 2026, 1st of January. We'll accept the second as well, but by 2026, all airlines will have the capability of using this one record approach to sharing data across the supply chain. So that's a very important target. 
It includes many things. We have developed a complete language for air cargo. It's more than just data, it's actually the whole language and how concepts interrelate and things like that. We're using web connectivity standards, so we didn't have to reinvent that wheel. Um, it's secure, uh, by definition almost, you can't do business otherwise. And essentially, we're creating a global data network for air cargo. Now, when I say air cargo, I already said it's from manufacturer to consignee, and that sort of brings you in touch also with the other modes of transport. So it isn't just air cargo, we also speak with our colleagues from across the other modes of transport. And then lastly, um, we started this project seven years ago, and even then we knew this had to be ready for AI. And so the technology we have used were preparing us for that. And as you've all seen the trends of what happened last year with ChatGPT and other models, AI is now here and it's going very, very fast, and we actually see some real positive benefits of having a standard like on record. The benefits are many. And it really addresses a lot of the issues around streamlining operations, getting better data quality, making sure that what we declare here and there is actually correct, uh, much better transparency so that parties from across the supply chain really know what is going on, including the customer, better security and compliance handling. This is often an issue when we have an issue with compliance, your freight simply stops where it is, and that's the end of your journey. Cost reduction, the ability to optimize your processes helps there. Customer service, customer experience, sustainability, and the last one is actually really important, which is interoperability. The ability for air cargo companies, whether it's the airline or the forwarders or others, to actually exchange data with other platforms, whether they are government platforms or other transport modes, is essential in the optimization and to get the results that we're looking for. So interoperability is at the core of this. Now, I mentioned just now uh, the sort of big impact of AI in the last year, certainly, but before as well. And what's interesting is that a tool like ChatGTP or others can directly query the data I'm talking about. That is something that, of course, when we started this project, we didn't know that would come. We expected it would, but we didn't know when or how. And this just works out of the box. So you can actually query this data, just like you would talk to a customer service uh, agent. So instead of saying, well, where does this shipment come from and go to? It's going from AMS to SIN. It will tell you the whole story of Amsterdam and Singapore if you want to. Because, of course, these AIs can help you with a lot more information. Lastly, um, a lot of this has been a lot of work for the industry. A lot of experts have talked about how we should design standards like this. But when it comes to it, it is an IT standard, it's a technology standard. So we organized hackathons twice a year now. The last one was in Doha just a couple of weeks ago. And during these hackathons, we bring together a couple of hundred uh, programmers, uh, business experts, who then innovate on the spot, 24 hours, 48 hours, to come up with great ideas. And at the last one, we had some 18 teams participating. I'm gonna, not going to talk you through everything, but there's a couple of highlights. One uh, really clarified the concept of how do you actually deal with AI. And the way that they, they projected it was that it's a conversation, just like it used to have with real people. And instead of just filling in forms like we're not getting really used to and, and annoyed that we have to do the job of the bank or someone else, you have a conversation and say, well, I want to move my dog. Okay, very good. The last time you moved, you gave me a certificate. Is it still better? Yes, it's still better. What do they have to say about the regulations for movement? And so these AIs actually on the spot during this hackathon, they integrated the complete system to have that conversation and to make a booking and to actually initiate a transport. So that was really nice. Another one was actually from a team from Turkish Airlines that used the experience of the earthquake in Turkey to realize that there were so many areas where this supply chain can do a better job that they actually came up with some quality, um, quality tools to improve the transport of goods, in this case during a crisis, but really in any type of transport. That was actually very inspiring to see how they use their experience in the real world in order to use technology like on record and artificial intelligence to do a better job. So with that, I hand back to uh, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Michel Schumann there, sorry. I have a question about your aircraft, actually. Uh, we have seen during the pandemic that there's been a rush of uh, freight conversions and the introduction of new types from Airbus uh, and Boeing. It, 
this, this trend this is continuing. Do you see that demand is continuing and that this confirms the need for all these freight conversions and new freight as a function? Um, so the first thing we can say is, is, is what the demand actually looks like as we move forward. So it's, it's uh, I would say, cautiously optimistic as we move forward. Um, and so the average industry growth next year will be 4.5% across the industry, and it varies from, from region to region. So in those regions, you will see variances as to how important freighters start to become based on the, the strategy of uh, the, the individual airlines. Um, then there is still a need uh, to continue to bring on board more modern freighter aircraft as well. So that's still going to be a need as we're starting to phase out the older aircraft, right, in particular wide body freighters. They're starting to slowly but surely get older and disappear from the market. So there is a need for that refresh to come and to continue uh, because we'll start to see that capacity actually drop completely off as they age out. Um, now, some, some freighter aircraft can go a little bit longer, for sure, but there, that, is, that is definitely what's happening. Rachel? Yeah, just uh, adding up for your reference in case it helps uh, in our uh, global outlook that was uh, released today. We have a subsection on aircraft and its uh, ordering and deliveries. Uh, you're welcome to take a look. Thanks. Yeah. And I assured uh, FEW in that respect, uh, Brandon, uh, we see that there are a lot of old age aircraft in the cargo fleets. So uh, this is not a good image for sustainability. Do you see in general a trend when more modern aircraft will join the cargo fleets because it's a common saying that old aircraft takes the Lufthansa's DC-10 or MD-11s were switched to some US-based airlines and so on so that cargo carriers continue with old equipment. Um, so, so you're right that there are still a number of older uh, freighter aircraft that are operating and there are different approaches. So we've seen, for example, what Lufthansa did with the shark skin to make that actual aircraft even more efficient than its uh, baseline. So we have some really good examples of where they're still focusing on that. And the other is that we do now have alternatives coming on. So we have uh, upcoming alternatives for more modern freighter aircraft, wide body freighter aircraft in particular. Uh, as well as the, uh, the the alternatives on the narrow body freighter, which is particularly good for for e-commerce. So I think there are a number of different positive options that are showing that the industry is focused on their sustainability and their their long-term emission strategy. Thank you. We will now proceed. Uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two quick things. Um, uh, it's Ian probably. I'm a bit mystified by the prediction of 3% growth in air cargo ne next year because the chart showed the dislocation of air, air cargo uh, from with rising industrial production post-pandemic. And although the IMF has pre present, you know, predicted 3% uh, global uh, GDP growth, the European economy, the EU economy, and certainly Germany is looking like over this recession, China is stagnating. For China, and uh, anyway, there's the, the dis, you know dislocation of supply chain, people trying to pull out of China, and so on. So I wonder about that, and uh, what assumptions you made. Is it just based on the IMF uh, forecast, and just on the generative AI use in in the digitization of cargo? Your your slide showed the chat GPT. And I wondered if you just wanted to clarify that, that, that because I'm assuming that would be an enterprise version of ChatGPT because the open AI version of ChatGPT would, would not be secure with data at all. Should I start with the first yeah. question? Um, thank you for, for this question and uh, glad to have the opportunity to, to explain. So first thing to note is that uh, this growth rate would be based from a, low, from a low base. You know, the air cargo has been decreasing for the past two years, and uh, uh, especially for this year, 3.8% decrease. So the, the growth of the next year will be based on that. And uh, in addition, the IMF is forecasting GDP to be at uh, 
uh, 3% this year and 2.9% next year, but the trade is uh, expected to grow at 4.5% uh, next year, if I recall uh, correctly. Uh, in addition, this forecast is an industry average, so um, if we look into regions, there are variance, so it's an uneven uh, development between all the regions. We're expecting highest uh, increase from Middle East, for example. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, last but not least, we're, um, you can see our uh, set of assumptions, including GDP, inflation, real interest rate, strengthen of USD, home employment, jet fuel price, um, recovery in China, and uh, the development of the war support. Of course, for now, our baseline expectation, uh, expectation is for war not to spread, and our baseline expectation is for China to have a strong recovery. But these are all assumptions for our, um, uh, for our modeling. Uh, details can be found uh, in the global outlook that's released today. Um, if any of these variables changes, uh, that will change the, the forecast of course. Thank you. Thank you. On the, uh, on the uh, chat GDP question, so there are in fact three points here. The first one is the data that we're accessing itself is protected. So that nobody, including tools that you use, could access data unless the party agrees to it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, there are many tools out there. We use ChatGPT as an example, which is recognizable on the slide. Uh, but the reality is there is literally dozens of uh, large language models that can be used for this today. And most of them are being used in, uh, in um, uh, corporate settings that are completely closed. You can't get out, you can't really get it outside your own company. So, that security aspect is currently being developed by a lot of companies, and it's relatively new, so I think that many companies are still experimenting with it and learning with it. Then thirdly, and perhaps that's the most important part, is that uh, when ChatGDB started, basically all the data they had was being shared with everybody, and it was a very bad thing, and even they've learned their lessons. Uh, but the reality is that learning from data will be entirely limited to within a company or to within an environment where we want that. Uh, and so um, it is possible that a certain day that we would love to see outside, maybe things like traffic patterns or stuff like that, but most of the data will be, uh, will be uh, firstly, limited restriction, limited model usage, and then the learning from that would also be limited to internal benefit only. Thank you, Hesh. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Rachel. Um, now we're going to move to the coffee break. Um, after the coffee break, we'll have a uh, presentation on industry with Nick Priority, which is safety, uh, with Nick Kareen, and we'll also be touching on how the pillar of data is transforming safety, operations, and sustainability. So we'll see you back here at 4 o'clock. Thank you.